So thrilled to have you here. I have loved the series that we've been in this month. We have been uh, going through a series called The Real Jesus. And uh, this is part four today. We started this at the beginning of of March, and really this whole series is getting us ready for Easter. We feel like, man, if we're going to celebrate on Easter, it pays to know what you're celebrating. It's easier to celebrate when you know what you're celebrating, why you're celebrating it. And, uh, and so we've been doing this series all about Jesus. And the focus of this series has been who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what it means for us. It's not enough just to, to have a bunch of information, know some facts. We want to talk about what does it mean for us who Jesus is and what he did. And so over the last four weeks, we've been looking and introducing different aspects and attributes, characteristics of Jesus and who he is. And the whole goal of this, this is my goal as pastor of this church, is to help you get closer to him. That's the goal of this thing is I want want you to grow closer in your relationship with God. And the reality is there's a lot of opinions about Jesus out there. There's a lot of different takes on who Jesus is and and, uh, and what he was about, and most of them are, I mean, some are based on tradition, some of them are based on movies, some of them are based on uh, pieces of art. There's all sorts of things that people draw conclusions from about Jesus, but we want to see what the Bible has to say about Jesus. We want to know truly, not just what public perception is, or maybe a misunderstanding or misconception about Jesus is, we want to find out what the Bible has to say, because the reality is many And if not most, don't really know Jesus at all. And so we want to do our best to help inform that. Our pursuit is to help you know Jesus better. In fact, at Seasons Church, our whole mission is to help people find and follow Jesus. Not just, again, not just to find him. We want that. We want people to get saved. We want people to start a relationship with God. But we also want people to understand how to walk with him, how to follow Jesus. And so in this series, we want to introduce people to the to Jesus, the real one. And um, that's what we're committed to. We're committed to preaching Jesus and seeing people follow him. Our theme verse for this series has been 1 Corinthians. And um, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know this is what we've been talking. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He said this, he said, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's sheer genius, that I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy He said, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. I love that. Like, we're not going to convolute it. We're not going to get it twisted. We want to take the word of God. We want to make it plain and simple. He said, our message is first Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. And our hope is to leave you with an understanding of, of exactly that, who Jesus is and what Jesus did so that your relationship will deepen and it will strengthen as you walk with God. So over the last couple of weeks, we, in week one, we looked at Jesus as the Son of God. We talked about how it's important that we have a view, that we have a theology, a belief system that recognizes Jesus as the, as the Son of God, that Jesus was in fact God's Son, that He is deity, that He was God in the flesh. In week two, we talked about Jesus as our Good Shepherd, We talked about how he leads us, where he leads us, the fact that he provides for us, protects us, just as a good shepherd does for his sheep. And last week, Jason Laird, a great friend, one of our overseers from Sozo Church in San Francisco, California, preached beautifully on Jesus, the miracle worker. And today, I want to talk about Jesus, the Lamb of God. And that's really where we're going to spend our time together today. I think it's fitting on Palm Sunday as we're approaching Good Friday and Easter next week. We're going to talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God and what that really means. And that's, that's our focus for today. I want to be very honest. This, this series has been, more of a, has been a bit more of a teaching series. You know, some series are a little bit more preaching. This one's been a little bit more teaching. The Bible tells us that Jesus went around preaching and teaching, that there's a different dynamic. You know, preaching will really, preaching is really like motivation. It's inspiration. It's going to like, get you fired up and go, man, I'm ready to make a change. I'm ready to make, make an improvement. I want to start something new in my life. And that's what preaching really does. It gets you going. And teaching really does something different. Teaching is about information. It really tells you how to change. It tells you what to change, steps that you can take. And we need both. And in our church, we're always going to pursue both preaching and teaching. And this series has been a little bit more teaching. So I want to teach today on Jesus, the Lamb of God. Does it sound good? Are you ready? You got your Bible, you got your notebook. Let's do it. Would you put your hands again and thank AJ for playing? We're going to give her a break. 
We'll let, we'll let you come back at the end of service, but take a break, and, and we're going to jump into the message right now. I want to turn your attention to John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. If you've got a Bible, turn there. If you don't, it's all good. We're going to put it on the screen this morning. But John chapter 1, verse 29, it says this. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. This is talking about John the Baptist. And he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. This is really how Jesus is introduced to us in a couple of the Gospels. And John the Baptist points points to him and he says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he uses this phrase, Lamb of God, and I think this is probably one of the best descriptions of Jesus. In fact, throughout the Bible, there are 104 times that Jesus is referenced as. He's called, he's referred to as the Lamb of God. 104 times. 50% of those 104 times happen in the first five books of the Bible. And then 25% of those happen in the book of Revelation. As you, if you know anything about the Bible, you know that's the last book of the Bible. That's where all the prophecy stuff is. That's the sensational stuff. We ought to do a series on Revelation at some point. You know, just like go through that thing. And so what we see, though, is that the Bible starts and ends. It begins and it ends with this idea, this presentation of Jesus as the Lamb of God. That's where it begins and it ends. But I really kind of want to talk about what does that mean because if we're honest, it's like, when are you going to hear a phrase like Lamb of God anywhere else other than church? It's like, what does that mean? Like, I want to make sure this is plain and simple today. That when we talk about the Lamb of God, why does Jesus have this title ascribed to him? What is it about him that makes this title fit? And so we're going to go back to the origin. We're going to go to the event known as Passover. Now, quick show of hands. I'm just really curious. How many of you have seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, the old one? I'm talking 1956, Charlton Heston, Ewell Brenner. Yes, okay. You, that's my people right there. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like when I'm growing up in the 80s, my parents had it recorded on VHS. I'm fast forwarding through all the commercials. I watched that thing over and over. This is like a four-hour movie or something. It's crazy. There's like an intermission in the middle of the movie. Like, let you take a break, go get some food, you know, all that stuff. It, it's a long movie. It was made in 1956. Cecil B. DeMille was the director. And, um, and it's, this, um, it's this incredible, like, movie when you think about it. It's a masterpiece because they didn't have, like, CG special effects and all this. Like, it's loaded with thousands of extras and the costumes and the wardrobe and all the set design. It's just, it's like, a, it's such an accomplishment at that time. And there's so many things about that movie that I loved. I just loved watching Charlton Heston as Moses and, and just watching the characters in that. And it's incredible. But if you've seen the movie, you'll know one of the most iconic scenes was the night of the first Passover. And this was at the end of the ten plagues that had, that had fallen on Egypt as God was working on Pharaoh to release his people. To release the Israelites out of bondage, out of captivity, slavery so that they could be their own people and go worship God. And so there's this this 10th plague, and it's when the angel of death comes comes through that region. And on this particular night, when the angel of death comes through, he takes, he kills the firstborn of every living creature that's in that area. So every family lost their firstborn on this night. And God protects his people. He, 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 through Moses, he instructs them to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood of the lamb when they sacrifice it and to put it on the doorpost, the side posts of the door, and the lintel across the top of the door. And by doing this, it was a sign of allegiance to God. It was about their alignment. And it was a marker that protected them. And when the angel of death came through, he passed over those homes and those families. They were spared from this plague. And this was the night of the first Passover, when the angel of death passed over. And it was a a night to commemorate. It's been celebrated since to commemorate that God protected. He delivered his people in that moment. That was the first Passover. And Passover is still celebrated today. It's this marker, this milestone. It's celebrating how God had set them free and protected them. And it has so much to do with the week that's ahead of us this week, what we would call Holy Week. This is the final week of Jesus' life on the earth. This is the end of his ministry. And Easter always coincides with 
Passover. They're always going to fall on the same week. Now, you may not realize this, but Jesus actually died on Passover. What we would know as Good Friday is, is actually the day that we would celebrate Passover on. And we call it Good Friday, and it's an interesting name because really it was only good for us. It was bad for him. It was not a Good Friday for Jesus and what he went through at his crucifixion. But Jesus actually gave his life on Passover. And so I want to show you this because Jesus was this picture of the Passover lamb. There was this, 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 this imagery that was used, this visual language that was given to him. And the Bible refers to him as the Passover land. And in fact, Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this. It says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And it was, if you were in the Jewish tradition, the Jewish culture, this would really speak to you because you would be very familiar with the Passover lamb and sacrificing that. See, lambs had been all used all throughout Jewish history. Ever since God had brought them out of slavery and bondage, he gave them the law. He gave them instruction on how to worship him. This is back in Exodus and Leviticus. Lambs had always been used throughout the year in Jewish culture, and it was a, it was a, a method of sacrifice that was payment for their sins. When a lamb was sacrificed, it paid for the sins of the people or an individual or a family. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it gives us some reason why this why this matter? Like, why would you sacrifice, you know, an animal? Why would you sacrifice a lamb? It says this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so this was how God established this part of their worship. This was how they stayed in right standing with God, was by sacrificing a lamb. And there are so many comparisons, so many similarities between Jesus and and the Passover lamb that we see in his Passion Week that make this evident. And it's this beautiful picture of the, this aspect of who Jesus actually was as the Lamb of God. I really just want to focus on three today. Three parallels, three points um, that I think illustrate this well. So we're going to talk through these three. The first one I want to give you is that when we talk about the Passover lamb, this context, and Jesus as the parallel, Jesus as the Lamb of God... I want you to write down, number one, the lamb was perfect. That when it came to the Passover sacrifice, the lamb had to be perfect. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, is when God was giving the Israelites instruction on how to go about this. It says, the animals you choose must be one-year-old males without defect. That means there couldn't be anything wrong with them. There could be no spot, no blemish on them. That there could be nothing wrong with it. They had to be in perfect condition and perfect health. And it says, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Now, here's what was interesting. On Passover week, as people um, came to Jerusalem, they came to the temple, as they, were going, as they were preparing themselves and their family for the Passover, they would bring their lambs to the temple for inspection. The land that they planned to sacrifice later in the week, they had about a four-day period of time where they would bring the lamb to the temple to be inspected by the priests, the religious leaders, and the priests would inspect it and then approve it for the sacrifice. And here's what's interesting. When Jesus arrived on Palm Sunday, was welcomed into the city, there was a following a four-day period of time before he was crucified on Good Friday. And there's this, this parallel, this picture, just in the same way that a lamb was brought, before, to, brought to the temple and brought before the priests and brought before the people to be inspected, that Jesus had this four-day period of time before he gave his life on Good Friday. And one of the first things that he did that we see when he came to the city was that he went to the temple. Now, you might remember the scene if you've been around church at all, or maybe you've read the Bible a little bit. There's this scene that sticks out because... For some of us, it seems so uncharacteristic of Jesus, right? It's the scene where he goes into the temple. He sees what's going on. It makes him mad. He, like, gets a whip put together. He starts flipping over tables, kicking stuff over, running people out of the temple. I can just imagine this scene. Jesus, got, he's got this whip. He is mad. He's, like, unleashing on all these people, running them out. What was it about this that made him so mad? Why would he respond this way? Well, let me give you the background. In Jesus' day, the priesthood was actually very corrupt. And so when we approach this, this story, what was happening is that as people were bringing their lambs for inspection, and the priests would actually 
pretend to find something wrong with that lamb. They would just, even if the lamb was perfectly suited to go, they would actually say, no, this one won't work. Sorry, not going to cut it. And the people were, were required to then go and sell that lamb, usually at a fraction of its value. And then they were, they were kind of stuck. They needed to get a lamb that was approved. And so they were forced to come back to the temple and buy one from the temple authorities, the priests, the religious leaders, at oftentimes double the price. This was pure extortion. And this is what made Jesus so angry in this moment. This is why he grabs the whip and starts running people out and knocking stuff over. It's because he's going, this is wrong. He was so enraged because these priests, the religious leaders, were making it hard on people to worship God. They were actually making it difficult. They were putting a barrier between people and their ability to approach God and to follow him in this sacrifice. They were destroying something that was sacred. But I think this begs the question, what is the big deal about what kind of lamb it is? Why does the lamb have to be perfect? Here's the thing you got to understand is that something can't be used for something if it needs it itself. Let me say it to you this way. The imperfect can only be redeemed by the perfect. Sin cannot be atoned by something that needs to be that needs atonement for itself. And so the lamb, the sacrificial lamb that was going to be used for Passover had to be perfect. And in the same way, if our sins were going to be made, if there was atonement that was going to be made for them, it had to be done by someone without sin. You can't atone for it if you need it yourself. And here's what's interesting is that we live in a day and age where I think people think that that heaven is not for perfect people. They think heaven is not for perfect people, but in reality, heaven is. It was designed, it's created for perfect people. You must be perfect to go to heaven, to be in the presence of God, a holy God who is perfect, and sin cannot be in his presence. We must, we would have to be perfect to go to heaven. And I think too many people today believe in this, this kind of this idea, this theory of like a 51% heaven. That is like if you think about your life in two columns, good, bad, right, wrong, you know, I've done the right thing and I've made some mistakes, that as long as I'm kind of, I got more in the good column than I do in the wrong column, that I'll be able to go to heaven. That if I'm just like 50%, 51% good, 49% bad, like I'm, I'm going to make it, like I'm good, I can, I can get into heaven. But the reality is, is like, I don't know that we can even say if, that's the, if that was accurate, if we, how could we even know what's good enough? What number is good enough? We're talking 61, 51, 73, 87, 99. Like, what is the number that's good enough? And then it would lead us to another problem, because now we'd have to start rating ourselves. Right? Like, so if there is a scale, and we know what the benchmark is, now we got to start rating ourselves. And so the question is, like, where would you rate yourself on that scale today? This is an interesting, like, mental exercise. Zero to 100. If zero is, like, Hitler, 100 is Jesus. Let's say in the 90s you've got, like, Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. Then, like, around 89% would be your pastor. You know, I think, let's just say, like, where would you put yourself on that scale? We all know that's not true. But let's just say, where would you put yourself on that scale? Where would you rate your life if you had to pick a number? And the problem is that, Heaven heaven is for perfect people. And you and I have fallen short of the glory of God. We have have all sinned and gone astray. That none of us are righteous. Not even one, the Bible says. It says that our righteousness, meaning our best efforts, what we think is good, is actually like filthy rags before God. That's the best that we have to offer. So it really doesn't matter where you'd put yourself on that scale if we're not a hundred If we're not perfect, we can't make it. This is a big problem. We need an answer to that. And we're incapable of creating that answer for ourselves. This is why Jesus is referred to as the perfect lamb. Why he's referred to as the lamb of God. Because in his life, he was the only person in all of history that was without sin. He's the only person who was perfect. And therefore, he is the only one who is qualified to pay for sin. He's the only one. This is why Jesus could even say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's only because he was perfect, sinless, blameless. That's why he can say he's the only way. 
I want you to look with me at 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed. Like, he's saying, hey, this is not about money. It's not about what you own. It's not about what you've done. Like, you, got, you need to understand. It's not with perishable things, natural things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that was handed down to you from your ancestors. But it was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. When we see these words, it was calling back to this picture of the Passover lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And it's saying that Jesus and his blood that paid for us, it was the only thing that could have done this. Nothing that you could do, nothing that you, that you could own, nothing that you could create on your own merit, your own background, your own experience could ever save you. It is only the blood of of Jesus. I can't help but think of that old hymn, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes me, makes me white as snow. Aren't you glad today for the gift of salvation that Jesus was the perfect lamb? Put your hands together if you're glad that somebody was able to pay the price for your sin. So number one, the lamb was perfect. Jesus had to be perfect. The sacrifice had to be perfect to atone for our sins. Number two, the lamb was sacrificed. The lamb was sacrificed. Look with me at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6. It says, Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. It's talking about the lambs that were being prepared for the sacrifice. There was this point that all of the community was going to get together and sacrifice, kill, slaughter the lambs for the sacrifice. And the parallel here. As much like the Passover lamb was slaughtered for the meal, was sacrificed, I want you to know that Jesus, Jesus didn't just die. He, wasn't, he didn't just sacrifice his life. What you need to understand about what Jesus went through is that he was actually slaughtered. The Bible goes so far as to say that he was marred beyond all recognition. In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14, this is a prophecy about Jesus and what he would go through. And listen to what it says. It says, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form was marred beyond human likeness. I want you to think about these words for just a moment. It's saying that he was, he was beaten beyond being recognized. And some translations give us this picture that he was hardly even recognizable as a man. You know, this week I was talking with a friend, and we were talking about the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And this, this movie came out a number of years ago, and maybe one of the best depictions, most accurate depictions of Jesus in his, the week leading up to his crucifixion. And the movie received this R rating because it was actually pretty graphic in its depiction of what Jesus went through. And we were talking about this. I was discussing this with this friend, and we're kind of remembering the first time that we saw it. I remember being in the theater and just feeling like, man, I, I just felt like I'd just been punched in the gut, like after watching it and seeing the imagery and getting a picture of what Jesus had gone through in order to pay for my sin. And we were discussing this and kind of talking about it. And even with all of what that movie portrayed, it does still not even capture Truly what Jesus endured, what he went through, what was done to him in that week, in that moment leading up to the cross. And I don't want to get too graphic on this to say for the sake of being graphic or gratuitous, but I want you to capture and I want you to catch a picture of the weight of what Jesus went through when he was sacrificed, when he gave his life for you. We all know about the cross that but there were things that led up to it. Jesus was, in fact, whipped by, by the Roman guards. And he was, the, the whip that they used was not just like this bull whip. It wasn't just a single piece of leather. But it was actually nine different strands. There was a handle, and there were nine different pieces of leather or, or rope that was woven together that created this, what they called a cat of nine tails. 
And this whip was specifically designed to exact as much pain. It was torturous. You see, the Romans were actually masters of torture in the way that they punished people, the way that they executed people. They were going to, they were looking to exact the maximum amount of pain and anguish and torment in that process. And this whip wasn't just a whip just of leather pieces, but there were tiny metal balls at the end of each of those pieces of whip that added weight to it, that changed the way that it flew through the air, the way that it impacted and, and, and wrapped around whoever was, was receiving the punishment. But not only that, but there were bits of oftentimes stone or bone or even metal that had been shoved through the leather that was attached to it all down the lashes of that whip. And so every time that the person that was receiving it, the beating, felt that go into their body. And as the whip was retracted, it would oftentimes pull skin, flesh, sometimes even bone off. This was a beating unlike anything that you could imagine. Jesus endured this. Then he was taken out into the praetorium and the guards just began to beat him, to have their way with him. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just human vengeance that was being exacted. There was a spiritual aspect to this. Because Satan himself was inspiring and creating hatred and exacting his vengeance on the Son of God in this moment. And they punched him and they beat him with rods. And they, the Bible tells us they pulled out parts of his beard and they took, a, they took this, these thorns and they made it into a, a crown. And it was maybe up to two inches long, these thorns. And they, they jammed it onto his head and pushed it into his skull, creating so much pain. And they took Jesus and they made him carry his cross to Golgotha where he would ultimately be nailed to the wood and the nails would be put through the bones of his hands or his wrist. And what you need to understand is that the crucifixion was one of the worst forms of punishments reserved for only the worst of people that wanted, they wanted to exact the most pain and put through torture. And the process of crucifixion happened over hours, sometimes days. It was basically slowly asphyxiating the subject, suffocating them. And while they might push themselves up with their feet to catch a breath, their body would not be able to hold them long. And oftentimes their arms were pulled out of socket before slowly they suffocated over a slow, long period of time. This is what Jesus, the sacrificial lamb of God, went through for you and for me because of the things that we've chosen to do in our lives, the things that we, the areas that we've walked away from God, rejected Him, and gone our own way. This is what Jesus went through. And finally, at the sixth hour of the day, which would be three o'clock in the afternoon, He breathed His last. He gave up His spirit. He surrendered Himself for us. See, Jesus went through this and paid this price. The Bible says that He was crushed for our iniquity iniquities, that he was pierced for our transgressions, that the chastisement, the punishment of our peace was on him, meaning that someone had to take the punishment for all of the wrong that we had done, and Jesus bore that on the cross on that day, on that Good Friday, and by his stripes, the Bible tells us that we were healed. This is what Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, went through for you and for me. Here's the amazing thing, you know, in, in the Old Testament, this was a regular custom to sacrifice a lamb for your sins. In fact, there was even instructions at periods of time where the, the people were instructed to sacrifice a lamb at, at, in the evening and a lamb in the morning. Now, this happened twice a day. I want you to think about adding that to your regular schedule. As you came home from work and before you went to bed, you had to sacrifice, uh, you know, sacrifice an animal, sacrifice a lamb to make sure that all your sins from that day, anything you did wrong was covered, it was taken care of. And then by the time you woke up the next morning, just sacrifice another one. Make sure that whatever happened overnight, that evening, whatever, whatever you've been doing, it was covered. You know? And this was a process that they went through. But here's the amazing thing that we see in Hebrews chapter 10 about the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. And it was something that only Jesus could do. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it says, We have, all, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once and for all. 
Day, by, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices. This was a picture of what had been happening up, into, up until this time. But it said that could never take away sins. But in verse 10, it says that Jesus, the sacrifice of the body of Jesus, was once and for all. That means that the past, the present, and future sins that you commit was covered by Jesus. This is not something you have to go through again and again. Every Sunday, come in, raise your hand at church. Go have a confession. Try and make sure you're covered since the last time that you did it. This is saying that Jesus, once you step into faith in Jesus, you accept the finished redemptive work that he did on the cross, that your life is covered once and for all. That's some good news. I think that's worth applauding right there this morning. Jesus' sacrifice was a once and for all sacrifices. It was the one to end all the others. And no more did we have to do this over and over again. Number three this morning, the lamb was shared. The thing about the Passover lamb and the thing that's true about Jesus as the lamb of God is that it was meant to be shared. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 4, there's instruction given. It says, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Because here was the principle. The Passover lamb could not be left unconsumed. Like you couldn't leave any leftovers. There was no to-go bag. There was no storing this in the fridge and join it the next day. for No, it had to be consumed in that moment. The Passover meal, it could not be left unconsumed. And oftentimes, it was more than one family could eat. And so there was this instruction that's given us saying, hey, if your, family's, if your family's too small, if the house is too small, invite your neighbor to come and be a part of this. Share it with them. And some of you might already see where I'm going. See, others were invited so that they could share the lamb, that more people got in on it. And it uses this phrase, it says, if any house is too small, I just want to say to you today, our church is too small. Like our church is, is, is too small. If it was five times bigger than what it is, ten times bigger than what it is today, it would still be too small. Every church in the world would be too small as long as there is one person that has still not had the opportunity, not gotten to share in the gift of the Lamb. That's the approach at Seasons Church. We're not just trying to stay like just like us four, no more. Like this is a thing that's open to everybody. And we're looking to share what we have received. During the Passover, others were invited to be a part of this. And if you've already experienced the benefits of Jesus as, as your lamb, as the sacrifice that he gave, if you've already experienced the blessing and the benefits of that, if you're already at the table, don't leave any left over. Don't let anybody miss out on this. Because Jesus' job was to pay for it, but it is our job to get the message out. It's our job to share it. This is the responsibility that we've been invited into as Christ followers. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, God was reconciling, redeeming, pulling the world back to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed or charged to us the message of reconciliation. That means just as you have freely received, now freely give. If you are in relationship with God now, he has made you a partner with him in the message of reconciling other people to him. That this is a partnership between man and God that's an incredible thing. That is not just God working on the earth. It's us being part of his work on the earth. And we want to get the message out. So here's this incredible opportunity. This is really kind of where I want to land the plane today. That's such a preacher phrase, isn't it? This is the land the plane. Like, when do you say that? And most other things. If you're in business, it's like close the deal. If it's just church, it's like, let's land the plane. Nobody's flying the plane today. But here's where I want to close. We have this incredible, amazing opportunity coming up next Sunday. I'm really believing for a miracle week, to be honest with you. I'm believing for souls to be saved next Sunday. I'm believing for lives to be changed next Sunday. I'm believing for people to find a church home that they can plant themselves in, people that they can connect themselves with. And so there's three things that I want to really call our church to. Number one, I want to call our church to pray. This week, I want to call every one of us to prayer. And this is what we're believing for. We're believing that people would be set free from darkness and deception. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, The God of this age, little g on God, it's referring to Satan. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel 
of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So what we're believing for is that people's eyes would be open, their hearts would be open, that they would be receptive to the message that's going to be preached next week. And we're praying for family members, for co-workers, for neighbors. We're praying for those who are lost and hurting to respond positively. We want them to respond positively to the invitation to come to church. We want them to respond positively to the invitation after the message for some of them that need to make a decision to follow God. So that's what we're praying for this week. So number one, I'm calling us to pray. Number two is to invite. And when you came in today, you may have noticed that on your chair, we've got two cards that are right there. One is an invitation for you to take and pass. Just got some basic information about Easter Sunday. There's somebody that God puts on your heart this week to invite. Some of you are already thinking of right now. I need to invite that person. This is just an easy way. Slip them this card. Let them know you'd love to have them come with you. Plan to go out to eat afterwards. Plan to save them a seat, whatever it takes. Plan to pick them up if you have to. But the other card that's on your chair is a card that really refers to this question, who's your one? Because I really believe that there's, there's one for us. When we talk about, we look at the parable of Jesus, and he talks about the 99 and going, leaving the 99 to go after the one. Each of us have one person, at least one person in our lives that we can reach out to. So what I invite you to do is there's three spaces on that card. If you've got three names that you could put down this week, people that you may work with, live nearby, family members that are close, that you can jot down their name on that card. And this week, I want you to take that card, put it on the mirror in your bathroom, dashboard of your car, wherever you can see it, to remind yourself to be praying for them, praying that they would be open to receive an invitation, praying for an open door to be able to invite them. Just yesterday, man, I was thinking about somebody that I have not seen in a long time. And I just, I just, for whatever reason, God brought them to my remembrance. Sent them a DM and just was like, man, I'm thinking about you. And, and um, man, we're going to catch up this week, go to coffee. And told me I'd love to see you for Easter Sunday. You would be shocked at what a text, what a DM, what a personal invite could do for somebody, especially this week. This is one of the best Sundays out of the whole year to invite somebody to come with you to church. It's an easy invite. We're going to have a great service next week, music, message, testimonies. I'm excited for what we're going to experience together. So I want you to take that card today. And if you need extra cards, if you're like, man, I got like five, six, ten people, whatever, we got extra cards in the lobby today that you can grab on your way out. And number three is this, is to participate. I want to invite you and encourage you to participate in next Sunday. Not just to be here, but I want you to look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. It says, in a loud voice they sang. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. We get this picture of a group of people that together they sang in this loud voice and they were worshiping God. And next Sunday, I want you to, I want you to come in ready to celebrate, ready to participate. I think this sends a message, a signal to people that maybe are far from God, don't have a relationship with God, maybe are new to church, don't really know how to do this. And they begin to see a picture of what it looks like when a community of people are united in worship to God. So let's participate. Let's serve. Let's celebrate in such a way next week that we're serving with all of our heart. Let's own next Sunday. Let's not miss this opportunity. So let's be praying. Let's invite. And let's participate. Because we want to share the gift of the Lamb of God. The gift of the sacrifice that Jesus paid for all of us.